Hello, and welcome back to Real Time Strategy, a podcast all about the gaming industry. I'm Sam Mosier. I'll be your host for the week, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Frank Lance, game designer and director of the NYU Game Center, to discuss his new book, The Beauty of the Games, which is available now. Frank, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I've greatly enjoyed reading the book. I'm excited to dig into it. Um, so thank you for the time. Thank you. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, so Frank, when we have a new people, a new person, a new guest on the show, we like to get started with an icebreaker, a get to know you question. And to set up discussion of the book, I, I feel it's appropriate to ask, what are your favorite games of all time? I would say, uh, how many can I give you? Can I give you a bunch? Of course, please. The more let's the merrier. Say, uh, <laughs> let's say Go, Poker, one Night Ultimate Werewolf, Set, Hanabi, uh, Wipeout, uh, Crackdown, and Rhythm Tengoku. Wow, that's that's a fun mix. <laughs> and it's just fun the ones that occur to me. Let me, add, let me add one more. Let me add one more. Yeah. That is at like 20 years old. Uh, Disco Elysium. That would Ooh, be, yeah, that's a that would be. And, um, and I'll add one more, Cinco Paus, a little uh, iPhone game that I love. So, okay, now I'm going to stop. That's that's enough. No, like I said, the more the merrier. And it's fun getting that list, having read the book, because um, as we'll get into, I was curious about the anecdotes and the example games you used in writing the beauty of games. So it's good to know, you know, figured that many of these had a personal connection to you. Um, although uh, <laughs> I... I it's fun hearing Crackdown because I know that did not get included in, in the final. Uh, I'm a huge Crackdown fan. I don't mention Crackdown in the book, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do believe it's a beautiful game. I mean, I think. I was going to say, uh, I need the sequel, yeah. The Beauty of Crackdown. <laughs> Crackdown for me is like, I know Grand Theft Auto is a masterpiece and I know people love Grand Theft Auto. I appreciate Grand Theft Auto. I recognize what's great about it, but it never really connected with me for whatever reason. I just never really, I don't really love Grand Theft Auto. I just, I admire it and I understand how important it is historically, but Crackdown, now that's a game that I just, for whatever reason, clicked with me. I loved it. I love the way it feels. I love, there's something about the jumping and the collecting of the agility orbs and this clockwork city. It's like got all of the, some of the elements of Grand Theft Auto in this kind of big artificial city. Uh, but I just find it, it's a little more cartoony. Uh, I just loved it. I loved it atmospherically. I just think it's weird and kind of haunting and beautiful as a space to be in. And then just mechanically, I love, yeah, the the agility orbs and the shooting is really satisfying. So yeah, huge, huge Crackdown fan. Yeah, I love that. Especially like you said, I, I have immense respect for Grand Theft Auto, but as somebody who grew up reading comic books and leans a bit more to the um, absurdist or, or, you know, otherworldly um, things that we can experience in games, uh, fusing all of the open world design and um you know, things that Grant the Dotto pushed forward into a bit more of like a, a superhero um, kind of world uh, was totally up my alley with Crackdown. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big superhero guy, but there is something about uh, the way Grand Theft Auto wears its adolescent rebelliousness <laughs> on its sleeve. It's so like, look, we look, we, we saw Goodfellas and now we want to make a video game that's like just like for grownups, you know, like the people who watch Goodfellas and, and uh, it's like, yeah, I get it, but it's, a, I don't know, <laughs> it's a little corny to me. Whereas Crackdown is just full on corny. I mean, it's just, there's no, there's no uh, attempt to be kind of like sophisticated or like, uh, you know, it's just, it's just doing what it does. And, uh, but I think what it does is, is quite, quite terrific. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I agree. I uh, Well, I'm excited to get into many of the other games you mentioned as we talk about the BD of Games. Uh, so for those listening, the BD of Games is out now. It released October 3rd. It's published by the MIT Press and it's part of their Playful Thinking series, uh, stealing a blurb about, you know, you might be wondering, what is the Playful Thinking series? It's a series of short, readable, and argumentative books about game studies that present new ways of thinking about games and new ways of using games to think about the rest of the world. And the Beat of Games did exactly that. 
Uh, Frank, this is one of my favorite books I've read this year. I flew through it. Oh, thank, um, you. thank you for the the early copy. And I mean, I will admit, um, you know, having what I just said, and maybe there's some listeners out there who had the same trepidations I did, published by the MIT Press, like, is this going to completely go over my head? Um, but I found it like immensely readable, digestible, and, and uh, having started a few new games since reading it, uh, it's already reframed the way I think about them. But not to get ahead of ourselves, Frank, uh, how are you feeling now that the book has been out for about a month? Well, I feel great now after this <laughs> wonderful <laughs> praise you've just given me. Uh, and uh, it makes me quite happy. And yeah, I'm super excited that the book is out. I'm, I'm relieved and uh, and excited. And, and I hope people read it and, and like it. Um, I really, uh, I, I'm looking uh, to have exactly the reaction that, that you just said, which is I, I'm hoping that, that it helps add another gear to people's appreciation of games. It just, you know, I, I want it to uh, just enrich people's experience when they, when they play games. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking, to, I, I really think that, you know, part of, part of what goes in the book uh, is that uh, I really encourage people to self-reflect. Like I'm not so interested in trying to convince people that my particular perspective is the, is the correct one to have. Uh, but what I do want to do is just encourage people when they, when they play games to just think about them. You know, how, how is this game affecting me? What do I like about it? Uh, what do I like about games in general? How do they contribute to my life? What's good about them? What's bad about them? Uh, what kinds of uh, games do I want to, you know, seek out and, and that kind of stuff. So I, I think the answers are all um, personal for, for people when it comes to things like art and, and culture. And so uh, this, this idea of like encouraging people to self-reflect is, is, uh, is an important one for me. Yeah, so that leads me to kind of my first question here is, is what was the origins of the beauty of games? How did it come about you, you know, trying to answer those questions or at least ponder them in the form of a book? Well, I, in addition to being a game designer, I've taught game design for many years. And when you teach, um, there is, I mean, teaching is, is, an amazing experience and it's it's also heavily subsidized you know if you're teaching college you are um, participating in a huge expensive industry that is heavily subsidized <laughs> we we think it's good as a society we kind of like foot the bill for people to 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 go to college and for for, for there to be such places where research and and uh and uh, teaching is is done, and so I kind of felt it was on me to uh, share what I thought. You know, the 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 whatever I I thought was useful about uh, my particular perspective. The in in getting an opportunity to kind of think deeply about these things and and research them and spend a lot of time uh, thinking and teaching about these topics. Uh, I think it's part of the responsibility to then share that, not just with the students, uh, who are, you know, in the program, uh, but with a broader kind of general audience, whatever, every opportunity, uh, that, that I get. So I really enjoy talking to people who aren't already kind of in the world of games about what games are, what's interesting about them, what's cool about them. Uh, and the, um, cause I think they're confusing. I think games are confusing. <laughs> I think most people like people like yes. us who are already <laughs> thinking about games a lot, we kind of know what they are and we kind of appreciate them and understand them. But I think most, even though games are huge, most people still don't. Uh, most people still look at video games like, what the hell are these things? Like, it's so confusing. Like, and so, uh, I really wanted to kind of reach a reach a broader audience with uh kind of the way that that i think about what is 
important and interesting and powerful and and beautiful and great uh, uh, about games. And uh, and so this this book was. I mean, that was kind of that one of the main inspirations that for for uh, making this book. Yeah, and it, it's cool breaking down the kind of audience targets as, as you did there, because as someone who has grown up not just playing but reading about games my entire life, uh, it again, as I said up top, like reframes the way I think about them, um, not just like how what i like about them but what they accomplish as a medium as we'll get into that's kind of the objective of the book um but you know not just me game player game lover game podcaster uh but i think anybody interested in just cultural objects and understanding their importance amidst like larger um aesthetic output that comes out the same thing that like what what makes an album great a movie great this book gets at what makes games as a, a form great um which i really appreciated and and that kind of brings me to my first question about the you know the content of the book itself um after a, a cool opening that i want to get to later um it opens with games are the defining art form of the 21st century um, which I like because the book kind of skips the question of like, are games art? I know that's like a, a question that sometimes gets thrown around a lot. And that question isn't as interesting, especially because I think the consensus answer at this point is yes, to some degree. And then the why um, is where the interesting part comes up. So what this book lays out is a framework for games as, as you call them, aesthetic objects um, of and then digging into what do these objects make you feel and how do they make your brain work? Um, did you at any point in the writing of this think about, did it start as a book about answering why are games art and moving on from there? Or did it, let's skip past that and get in deeper? Yeah, the, the reason I, I try to skip that is that our games art is a meme. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not a serious <laughs> question. It it's like a meme, and and the reason it's a meme is because it is just overloaded with all kinds of implications. We use art to mean, on the one hand, paintings. You know, like fine art, mm -hmm. like that you find in a gallery or a museum. Like that's one meaning of art, uh, and and with that all of the kind of implications of that, the connotations of fine art, which are all about like its status as like, it's very high status. It's, it's fancy, it's deluxe, it's, uh, it's good. It's good for you. You know, it like has all of these like, like weird connotations that I think are just a red herring. Like that's not like what we really mean when we ask or asking this kind of question is hey, in general what sort of things are games you know uh -huh. and so um i think in gen it's obvious that in general the sort of things they are are like they're like music they're like dances they're like plays they're yeah they're like paintings a little bit or or poems or or novels uh they they're they're, they're, they're something like that um but you know and when you think about it in that context it makes it's just less high strung. It's less high maintenance as a question, right? It's less overloaded uh, with all of these like weird connotations about uh, about history and and culture and uh, using the term art to be a, a superlative that means oh they're really special and good. It's like no, no, they're like albums. Like most of them are terrible, or they're just not for you, or whatever. <laughs> like they're album. Don't no one no one worries about whether Taylor Swift is art or Lana Del Rey is art. They just like they, they like some, they don't like others. You know, I like Radiohead, and I you know I don't like Weezer or whatever. Like like no one's worried about like how these things stack up with Michelangelo or. Da Vinci or or Mozart, it's fine. They're just they're they're pop culture, um, but they're also they're 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 creative things that we do for their own sake. They they exist in this kind of interesting 
domain where it's very much about personal judgment, but then we're also collectively deciding which are important. And some of them are like extremely broadly successful and, and kind of like define the landscape of culture, like, like the Taylor Swift or the Beatles or Mozart mm -hmm. or <laughs> Da Vinci. And some of them, uh, very few people have heard of, but they're um, still profound and transcendent. Like you can stumble across something that, uh, that has a huge impact on you that isn't in a museum. Um, it's just like a, a thing that exists in the world, but for whatever reason it works. And so that's, that's what, when I say aesthetics, instead of the word art, um, it's in order to kind of bypass all of that baggage and just frame it in a way that is, I think, more clear and kind of everyone can sort of agree. Yeah, there's, they're a thing like that. But then once you, yeah, once I, you recognize that it's still, it's mysterious and hard to understand what things like that are, you know, like, it's not that it's easy to talk about the, you know, the difference between, um, the Beatles and the Backstreet Boys and the you know, Sex Pistols and um, the Ruddles and Frank Zappa and like, well, which of these things are good and which of them are terrible? And, um, you know, how can we <laughs> navigate that? That's just, that's still deeply complicated and, and confusing and interesting and fun. It's just less fraught by these confusing images of like, museums and galleries and churches and other kinds of religious artifacts. Mm -hmm. I loved the, uh, as a avid consumer of new music and reader of like the top 50 albums list that comes out at every year. Uh, I really liked the music comparison to gaming used throughout the book. Um, especially as someone who like, if you would ask me what's the most apt comparison medium to medium wise to gaming, I, I would have told you reading um, before this because it requires a certain degree of user uh, input in order to progress, uh, you know, in the case of a book through the pages of it or through the game, make progress through whatever your objective is. But I liked, you know, gaming is weird because it's both um, things prepared for you and then it, it's a matter of medium. Like, are you playing it with friends? Are you playing it alone? Are you playing it in a crowded arcade? Um, same thing of like music. Yeah. Are you listening with headphones? Are you listening at a party? Are you listening at a concert? Um, thinking about all these things, but still trying to get to the the seed of the idea of what makes this special, um, I found to be a really cool mission of the book. Like you said about the aesthetic, which is a word that gets thrown out all the time. And again, similar to like, why are games art is not something I could uh, eloquently um, answer succinctly. Um, I appreciated, I was rereading sections of the book before the, recording this, um, going back to Emmanuel, Emmanuel Kant uh, as kind of a, a forebear of what we think of as aesthetics and using that as just shared experience, something that we all can partake in, or at least some people can partake in, and you are going to have a similar emotional response as somebody else, or at least... Yeah the prospect of having the same emotional response as somebody else. That's yeah. like part of what makes Baldur's Gate 3 this year so special. It's like- It's true, the ba Baldur's Gate 3 is a, is a great example. Yeah, um, and I remember uh, I went to, I, I played Baldur's Gate 3 and went to see Barbie uh, around the same time. And I remember thinking <laughs> of them as in a weird way, like kind of similar. They were both popping off at the same time. They were both kind of like, the thing of the moment. Um, and I remember thinking that Baldur's Gate 3 held up pretty well as pop culture next to Barbie and, you know, <laughs> yeah. as, as a thing that I could point to and say, yeah, this is uh, very, very different, um, but kind of equally interesting. And in some ways they're both about toys. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like Baldur's right. Gate I didn't is think kind about of that. a, yeah, Baldur's Gate is kind of about action figures. You know, computer RPGs are a little bit about like playing with action figures. Um, and, but uh, in a really complicated, interesting way with, and Baldur's Gate also explores sex in a way that, you know, like some, not, not you know, uh, like in, in, in its own way, uh, Baldur's Gate is, a, uh -huh. is also a, a, a game about sex. And um, 
and and uh, identity and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, like I, I I agree with you that um yeah it's, it was an intentional goal to kind of displace cinema as the main analogy mm. uh, and instead use music. To, I try to use music because to me that's a better fit. Uh, I think that one of the things that makes games hard to to write about and talk about in in the kind of mainstream discussions is how much it looks like cinema like it's screen mm -hmm. like video games are screen culture and so we tend to really kind of compare them side by side with movies and think that they're they're maybe they're like movies plus interactivity right maybe that's what games are and i think that's a very misleading uh kind of direction to go i think it's much clearer if you think of them alongside music uh because they are in many ways they 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 sh they're more fundamentally they share a lot of the same qualities of music that they are participatory in a way music is that they include both composition and performance that uh you can sit and listen to a song but also uh you often in in music you you make the song go like like if you are playing the piano you know it used to be the pop music was something you bought as instructions like you go to the sheet music store and buy instructions for uh you know how to play a pop song and you'd like oh this is a good one and then you'd have to like your skill at being able to make the song go is part of the experience of of enjoying the song and uh and so all of the the, the kind of aspects of of skill and and performance that are uh, so much a part of of music uh, are are there in games as well, and it just it runs the whole gamut, uh, and it kind of gets you away from overemphasizing the visual aspect. I mean, I do think, obviously, in video games, the visual aspect is central and very important, um, but it is uh, it can be so prominent that it kind of occludes the important stuff that isn't visible on screen, that is about pattern and structure and form. Uh, and so these are things I wanted to emphasize uh, when talking about games in the book. Yes, yeah, so when talking about games, the one of the kind of core takeaways I got from it was boiling it down to this thought here of games as thought made visible to itself. Um, and that that thought is that in games as a vehicle or an, uh, an aesthetic way for us to recognize and appreciate the way our brains work is something that is lost when we most readily compare games to movies is another thing I, I didn't really consider before reading this. And that when we think of games most similar to movies, we tend to think of the, uh, the, for, for lack of a better term, or the way we use it, aesthetic qualities of like the, the graphics, the art design, the music, the performance, the narrative. Um, whereas what we lose in there is the way our brains see the Tetris blocks falling and just know what the next move inherently needs to be um, because of the way our brains are wired after playing enough of that game that it just becomes like a sixth sense. Um, and yeah. that is not something you can as easily articulate as, oh, I love the music that plays when the Tetris blocks fall. Um, right. So then re returning back to like the, the music comparison, you know, music being the aesthetic vehicle for listening, of, of truly using that sense in a way that we're not used to just, or at least thinking about in the way that we do it just in everyday activity games doing that in the same way for thought uh mm. was that something you had taught was this kind of fundamental theory um something you had been teaching and you wanted to include in the book or was this something you came to in the writing of the book i think it's something that emerged gradually out of this process of research and thinking and teaching and designing games and self-reflecting on what is it what's going on when you play a game like what what's happening mm -hmm. and uh and then 
thinking about these comparisons, like if you like, yeah, so to me, step one in, in helping people understand what games are and what's cool about them, like step one is is getting them to like, just see them alongside other art forms and like music and, and painting or novels and just kind of understand, okay, that's what they are. Because even that step is a little confusing. Like some people, I think a lot of people still don't see them that way. A lot of people look at, at video games especially and they think, oh, they're like appliances, right? It's something I plug in <laughs> and then I get to pretend to be a fireman or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're like virtual <laughs> reality appliances where we, they're like the holodeck, you know? And, and um, it's like, no, no, there's something more like an album or, uh, or a song or a poem or, or a dance or something um, is uh, getting people. So then once, once you take that step, you're like, okay, well, what kind of, of cultural form are they? What kind of creative form are they? What is that experience like? And, each one of those different media have they're a stylized version of a part of experience so like you said in music there is the the act of listening and the quality of sound as part of our experience and it's just it's with us all the time and we are just we're embedded in a in a world where we use hearing and and listening to to, to understand the world and to navigate through the world and to communicate with each other and to do, to do all these things. But then with music, you do that for its own sake. You, you listen just to be listening and to understand what listening is. And you pay attention to sound, to, to appreciate sound for its own sake and the structure of sound and how our, our minds work to, to, to elicit meaning from sound and how sound, how we use sound to communicate and how the, how the world creates sound and what's beautiful about it and so on and so forth. And, and then for, for something like painting, th that is true of, of vision of like, we we're constantly looking at the world and using our eyes and seeing and looking and, and then with visual art, like painting, we, do that activity for its own sake. And that's a way of kind of like diving into the act of looking and kind of being able to appreciate it for its own sake. Like, what is it? How do, how do our eyes and our minds structure the world visually? And what is beautiful and interesting about that? And how does it work? So then what's the equivalent for games? And my answer that this book is basically about is that the equivalent for games is thinking and doing it's being an agent in the world it really is what it means on a fundamental level to be a conscious thinking creature to perceive the world to predict it to model it to have goals that you are seeking things you're trying to avoid uh, to be an active, conscious, thinking, feeling agent in the world doing stuff. And so that is what we do in games for its own sake. We do a stylized version of that. Uh, they're like a toy version of being alive in a world, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and for me, that really helped clarify what what's going on in games and how they function uh, alongside these other art forms in their own unique way to create experiences that are that are more or less beautiful or meaningful or interesting or entertaining or uh and uh yeah so this this quality of games being like a kind of homebrew neuroscience that we do on ourselves, a way of opening up mm -hmm. our heads and seeing what, how it works inside. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. And, and you can see it. I think if you like, you can like, it's clear, like um, once you start again, once you kind of self reflect on your own experience while you're playing a game, you can kind of see this happening, right. That, uh, that you can see this process of, of learning, of understanding, of exploring, of figuring out, 
uh, you know, how does this work? What, how do these things fit together? What, where am I, what's going on? Um, and, uh, and it's the thing that is this deeply human, it's just the foundation of what it means to be a conscious being, but we don't often, we're not aware of it because we're too embedded in it. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like you can't, you can't look at yourself looking <laughs> and you can't, you know, you can't think it's very hard to think about yourself thinking. Um, yeah. But uh, in games, I think you 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 do because you get this little toy version of it. Right. You get this little uh, imaginary or uh, this kind of t- tiny carved off uh, corner of the world in which you uh, you get to both immerse yourself in the process of of being an agent in the world of seeking goals and trying to accomplish things and succeeding or failing and, and learning and, and, uh, understanding and perceiving and, and modeling and all this stuff you do as a, as a brain. Uh, but then you also get to kind of in a weird way, pull back from it and observe it as if from a distance. Um, Mm -hmm. and so that to me is the kind of, yes, special kind of double consciousness of of interacting with with a game and exactly what you just said that taking a step back is what this book kind of helped me do with the way i think about my favorite games uh of consciously taking that step back and it's like what about this game and the way it, it makes my brain create certain connections or uh, recognize certain patterns or yada yada, however to succeed or process or just enjoy um, said game was not something I, I really went to when, you know, critiquing or analyzing what about certain games connected with me. And now I'm playing like Spider-Man 2 and I'm appreciative of the rhythm of the swinging or the way I just know how to bend around a certain corner of a skyscraper um or the momentum of i'm playing 3d world with my girlfriend right now and uh, super mario 3d world and uh the momentum you have when you're you're holding down the sprint button when you're about to take a certain jump um and you just instinctively know that if you're holding it and taking at the speed and you hit jump you know where you're going to land and how far mario is going to skid forward it's just um this certain things we don't think about because um the best made games have us think in that kind of way is truly beautiful. And, um, you know, you mentioned, that's great. Like, I, I'm really same, happy. Yeah. I'm really happy yeah. to hear you say that. And it is, it is my goal to encourage people to kind of just make, make the full loop like games, like one of the reasons that games are hard to write about that there isn't a lot of kind of mainstream discussion of games, the way there is of movies and music, they tend to be a little more insular. Like there's a lot of writing about games and there's a lot of discussion about games, but it doesn't exist in this kind of shared public conversation the way that movies and and music and other art forms Mm -hmm. do. And I think one of the challenges is that games are so compelling and so complex and so deep that you can just you can often just make a one-way journey. Like you can make the journey into Spider-Man three <laughs> and then you never come back out. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't then complete the circuit <laughs> and then think, Oh, well, how did, did I like that? You know, how does it compare to crackdown and grand theft mm-hmm. auto and other kinds of like clockwork city games and what's different. Like, what do I, you know, what did I enjoy about that? And what did I not enjoy about that? What do I want more of? And what do I want less of? And how does it kind of reflect or echo with other kinds of things? And I, and it's not that I want that to interfere with the enjoyment of games. I mean, I think some people worry that analyzing, overanalyzing things is a way of kind of draining what's fun about them. And I'm definitely not in that business. I don't want, like, it's not my goal to like, try it, to encourage people to intellectualize their experience with games uh, or to kind of overthink it. Like I, I'm, that's not the, that's not how I experience games. I'm just a gut level. Like I jump in and I'm just there to like, I'd <laughs> want the thing to hook me and I want to be pulled in and I want to experience it as it was intended. And I want to have my, you know what I mean? I just want to be taken away. And often I want to be 
overwhelmed by a game and, and distracted by it or, or, you know, all the things that, uh, that you do when you have like a, a real deep connection with a game that's working and you're just kind of swept away by it. Like that's my, that's, that's what I'm looking for as, as a, as a player. Uh, and so I, I'm not like, I don't, I'm not telling people, oh, they should approach games you know, with it, with a monocle, you know, or like a, <laughs> a telescope or something where it's like, no, 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 just get in there and just have it do all the things that, that games are good at. But then, then complete the journey and come back and, and at that point, reflect on, on your experience. And cause we all know that experience. Sometimes we can be swept away by a game. And then afterwards we're like, ugh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, that was <laughs> awful. Like, because games are very powerful and they are um, cognitive. They're uh, um, psycho technologies is what uh, John Verveke would say. I don't know if you know this YouTube guy, John Verveke, uh, uh, but he would describe, and I, I agree. I think that um, they're powerful psycho technologies. They are like drugs, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, they are very much like they can overwhelm you and overpower you. And I think it's part of what's great about them. I like, look, I, I think the, you know, but light drugs, it, they, you know, you want them to be part of a overall life that is good, you know, that is going in the right direction and where you are kind of consciously thinking about how you spend your time and what matters to you. And, and so, and games should, should be part of that. So that after you play a game, you you are thinking about it, uh, in a, re, you know, reflecting on your own experience of what, what is it that you got out of it and what did it do to you? And did you like that? And was it good? And do you want more of that in your life or less of it? And what other games sh could you play or should you play? And how should you think about these, these things and how they, that's all. I just want people to kind of complete that, that journey. Yeah, it, it's a positive reframing, even when, like you said, maybe the uh, the takeaway is not necessarily negative, but you can recognize even in a game that might be um, preying on our, our lesser tendencies that there's still something about it, like it helps you make sense of why it works. One of the parts of the book that made me laugh out loud reading it next to my, my partner was uh, the section about poker. And uh, you quote Phil Ivey. I have it pulled up here to read. Uh, I like it when I lose so much money, I can barely breathe. That's the feeling I go for. I'm addicted to that feeling, um, which yeah. I think most people would not be like proud to admit. But reading it right there gets to what about the game of poker is so compelling. Yeah, you can't. You're not going to get to the truth. I'm interested in getting to the truth about what's going on in games. Like, I, I, I also look, I want people to recognize what's great about games. And uh, I, I want games to kind of have more of a seat at the table when we talk about important things in the world, you know, in the same way that the other art forms do. I kind of want games to participate in that, that ongoing collective conversation in a way they don't currently. I want all of those things, but I'm not here to sell snake oil, right? I, I don't think mm -hmm. anyone is benefits from a from a BS story that that you know games are fantastic and they're great and everything's good about them and they you know no games like every other type of culture uh, are are complicated and there's a lot of darkness in them uh, games are powerful and they do like when you play a game often what you're doing is similar to putting yourself in a maze, putting yourself in like a mouse going into a maze in a psychology experiment. You're intentionally doing it. Like when you put yourself in Baldur's Gate, you're putting yourself into a kind of Skinner box, right? Mm -hmm. One in which there are certain things that you're, there are goals that you're seeking, there are rewards that you're getting, there are obstacles that you're overcoming. And you're voluntarily putting yourself into a psychological experiment uh, in order to get a certain kind of experience that's pleasurable and powerful and meaningful. But also, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity there to learn about yourself, 
about how you respond to to incentives, how you respond to punishment and reward, how you learn. Like, what are the obstacles for why are you so bad at Baldur's Gate? You know what I mean? Like, why can't you beat <laughs> yeah. this one boss? Right? Like, mm -hmm. what's going on there? What did you miss? Like, what or um, you know, whatever. There's like, there's like a world of things to learn uh, about not just about yourself, but about other people and about the world. Uh, but but psychological experiments are dangerous. Like they're they're not. It's not a um, it's not a haunt. It's not a haunted house at a carnival. It's like a real haunted house. You know what I mean? Like they're real ghosts in games. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like yes. You know what I mean? It's like not. People, I mean, yeah. Yeah. They're. <laughs> And that's, that's the, the thing that the philosophy about, like, quote, like the, about poker, you right? Know? Yeah, that's like you said uh, earlier, kind of on the start of this topic about seeing games as toys. It's like that's that's the seeing them. That's the seeing them as toys is a danger because there are real dangers there, especially when when money gets involved. And and that's the the both the the attractive and the dangerous part about poker. And as you line out in the book, is the thought exercise or one of the ones that's so compelling about the game is the way it turns money into like a game mechanic. Um, and yeah. it's this opportunity for us to separate this thing that we're normally so protective and weird about that thing being money. And all of a sudden it yeah. becomes the vehicle for this game that then changes the, like it gamifies reading people and communication and body language. And it yeah. encourages us to think about those things in a way that we don't in our everyday life. Uh, again, returning to the whole kind of listening for the sake of listening in the case of music. Yeah, I mean, poker, yeah, as you know, I love poker. I talk about it a lot in the book. Poker and Go <laughs> uh, are, are two um, of the biggest kind of case studies uh, where I or I take this approach and, and apply it. And I, I just spent a lot of time playing poker and I loved it deeply, uh, but I also really recognize what's, dark about it and and uh and but i think um yeah this like it, that's that's an example that that i really emphasize in the book is the way like the relationship of money in poker is so strange because you know we have this thing in the world money which is super overdetermined in all of the ways that it is <laughs> and uh we kind of love it and we hate it and it uh we're constantly seeking it but we also know it's imaginary and and made up and we try to get away from it being too influential on us but it's hard to escape and then and then you play this game poker which is just about money where the whole goal of the game is just to maximize the amount of money you're making and in order to play poker well, you have to stop thinking about money in all the ways that you normally think about it. And you have to treat it like a abstract, logical, quantitative measurement of a thing that's just like, like a side effect of this decision-making exercise you're doing. You have to like get good at this kind of complex math and psychology problem in order to make the money number go up. And so in a way it's like, it's all about money, but then it's also like for a second, you get to like escape from money. So you escape from money by mm -hmm. diving into money. Like what the hell is going on in poker? Like, it's so <laughs> weird. Like what the hell, like what kind of art form could that possibly be where in order to like, like you're surrounded by this thing that is, you know, influencing your life and your perception of the world in all these different ways. And in order to escape from it, you kind of like build a model of it and jump inside of it. And, and now you're inside of money and inside of money, you can see the world again because the world really is math and people and self-control and understanding your own emotions and being able to kind of, you know, disconnect from your own appetites and desires and reactions and fears and replace them with conscious thought and and deliberate problem solving and self-control and all of a sudden now you're like meditating and you're learning uh, you know <laughs> you're, you're you're learning math and 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 you're thinking about <laughs> other people and, and it's like it, but you're also just trying to get 
paid. You're also trying to make that number, yeah. <laughs> number go up because you want the money because you're trying to like, you want to buy a watch and buy it, put a slide in your apartment and move to Las Vegas and <laughs> have bottle service. It's like, it's, and, and, and I'm, and I'm claiming that that thing, that whole experience is a little bit like Mozart. You know what I mean? Like how? Like, but it is a little bit, right? It's a little bit like, like the experience of, you know, getting deeply into like a genre of music and, uh, and and like, like p playing poker casually is just like listening to heavy metal, you know. But like mm -hmm. playing poker seriously is like joining a metal band and mm -hmm. uh and touring with it you know um and i know that mozart isn't metal but look my metaphors are great <laughs> they're better in the book right they hold together better in the book but you get what yes. i'm saying <laughs> but that's the fun thing about reading this book is is like you said finding the mozart in in poker or you know one of some of the examples we haven't gotten to yet and, and we've danced around it a bit with you know poker and go is that we the book looks beyond just video games um you know talk right. about games as a whole and how are those aesthetic objects like you know speaking of dangerous games in a way poker is financially boxing uh is sure. by all means uh an aesthetic object in the way these other things are and that like there is a, a beauty and a grace to watching great boxers fight but at the end of the day it, it is still violence it's violence made art and uh yeah thinking about the way that great boxers have to observe and perceive and, and, and move um, in order to succeed is uh, like part of that, the rational thought at the, the core of all these great games that you right. outline in the book. Yeah. When yeah, in the writing um, process, yeah. did you think about like folding in real life games like that? Well, yeah. So, yeah. So that's sort of like step two of the book's argument, right? Step one is, look, games are something like an art form. You should understand them alongside these other art forms. I'm going to use the term aesthetics so that we don't get hung up on art. But basically, there's something like music and film and painting and poetry and dance and blah, blah, blah. Right. That's step one. Then step two is also the best way to understand video games in particular, is to see them as part of this broad category of culture that's been around since the beginning of civilization and even before it, uh, which is games in general, uh, strategy games, board games, party games, social games, sports, uh, all of these things are, are games and video games are just the kind of most recent version of that. Um, but they're really to understand what's happening in World of Warcraft. It's actually helpful to understand what's happening in golf. Do you know what I mean? Like that? And that's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. oh, weird. But like, it's I think it's true. Like, I really think it's true. And like, it kind of helps because there has been a lot of great examples of people writing about uh, non digital games. Uh, if you think about people like Joyce Carol Oates writing about boxing, uh, David Foster Wallace writing about tennis, uh, CLR James writing about cricket. There are many examples of people, uh, you know, kind of helping illuminate the beauty and meaning of, of games, but they're, you know, pre, pre video games. They're not talking about digital games. And I think that's a, a big inspiration for me. Um, and then, Step three is like once I've I've kind of like made that point that look video games are are games uh, they're part of this broad category and we can see the the things that connect them. Then I say in in step three I say at the same time all games digital and non digital have this strange deep connection to computers and computation, so that it's. Yeah. Uh, because games are systems, they're systems of rules. Boxing is, chess is, tennis is, golf is, crackdown is, wipeout, <laughs> rhythm tengoku, right? They're, they're little systems. You design a little machine out of rules, which say what you can and can't do, and your goal, which is what you're trying to do, and then the materials that are kind of 
contain some additional constraints about how the world works and how things fit together and Tetris pieces fit in a certain way and the ball at the end of the string on a Diablo toy fits a certain, you know what I mean? Like, and, <laughs> and you're making a little system out of that. It's, and, and understanding the parameters of that system, understanding the ramifications of those rules, extrapolating what they mean, like understanding the space of possibilities that, uh, that they create, this is computational. Like it is a, this is a, this, this is the experience of being a player in a game has this kind of like, always has this kind of relationship to, to systems and, uh, and their behavior and how that, that behavior emerges, uh, over time, uh, as the consequence of this kind of necessary consequence of the interaction of these rules. Right. And so mm -hmm. games, I think, I mean, there's, it's not a coincidence that video games, like when games met computers, they, they had a baby and the baby is called video games <laughs> and that baby is now ruling the world, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that baby is now bigger than music and film combined in terms of its impact, you know, on the economy at least. Uh, and I want to somehow make it more than just its impact on the economy that matters. I want all, all, us also to recognize what's happening here. The games mm -hmm. and computers have done this thing where they came together, like in a way, like in the book, I say games invented computers, which is kind of a provocative way of, of making this point that games have always had <laughs> this connection to systems and computation. Um, but like, like video games really genuinely are a crucially important aspect of our relationship to the modern world. Like we've, we've got these things, they're called computers. What are we going to do with them? Like, what are they good for? Like, do we want them? Like, is this the right way to, to think about the world? Is it computationally? Is this the right way to think about ourselves? Are we a computational process that is, that is running, uh, that just hijacked, the brains of these advanced apes and now we're kind of like yeah. running on it are we a something are we something like software and now that we're inventing mm. other things that are potentially going to be thinking agents in the world like what is our relationship to them and I, I i don't think novels i mean i think there will be great novels about this i think there will be great films about this there already have been her you know is a great film mm -hmm. about about ai but i think there's a potential for video games to speak to these questions in a way that is deeply illuminating uh, of this of this fundamental tension um, about uh, computers, what they're for, what what we want out of them, how to you know how to how to use the concept of information and data and computational processes and rules and logic and the machinery of, of, uh, of, of logic and rules, how to think of the world in that context. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's what's at stake here. Like that to me, that's, is like, that's yeah. Yeah. That's what I want games to, you know, wake up and, recognize that that is their legacy that's their potential that's their responsibility to speak to these issues um and uh and not just look i nothing against spider-man 3 <laughs> i think it's you know it sounds like a fun game but i think they're you know we should be looking we, we should have all the ambition of of, of musicians and and filmmakers and uh, novelists to really speak to our historical moment and make work that that helps people navigate the world they're in um, in and uh, and so yeah that's part of what I, I want the, the book to inspire people to do yeah that's a rewarding part about like all three of those steps that you've outlined here about you know what you want people to take away from the book one just being providing a framework to appreciate the games we do play Two, recognizing the lineage of video games and how they come from a, a deep history 
um, of of other of games, and I think by and large, and whether this is a good or a bad thing, sometimes history and line- lineage is often important for people to appreciate a medium for what it is. Again, like music now and drawing it all the way back to Mozart, if you will. Uh, and then step three, looking to the future of what games can represent and do. Um, and and you know, if we can recognize the systems in our games and the way they make our brains work, that helps us then recognize the systems in our everyday lives and how to make sense of those as well. Yep. Well said. Um, so, I mean, with all that, I don't think I've really acknowledged it yet. With all that being said, the core content of the book itself is, is about 160 pages. It covers a lot of ground in a short amount of time. It's very readable. What was the editing process for the book? Like, was it difficult getting all these ideas down into a fairly succinct um, form? Uh, it was easy. No, it was easy. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> I've never written a book before, so I don't know. I don't have anything to compare it to. It took like 10 years. It wasn't that easy. Uh, I had a great editor's uh, shout out to the to the editorial uh, folks at, at MIT Press. Um, good, great copy editing. You know, I think that uh, it was a lot of nuts and bolts stuff about... Uh, like I'll give you one small example, which was the the way that I treat game titles in this book is different from what is considered the standard correct way of doing it. So it's different from the, what they do in the New York Times or in the New Yorker, which is the way they do it is if it's a video game or a commercial game with a trademark like Candyland, then mm. it gets capitalized. And if it's not a commercial product, so if it's chess, it doesn't get capitalized. So you capitalize Candyland and you don't capitalize chess. And to me, that just seemed weird. <laughs> like, like <laughs> it just seemed like and it, you're looking at it and you're looking at like all of these different treatments. And it just, I was like, okay, no, we're going to capitalize titles of works. And, and chess is a work, even though it's a work of folk culture. There's no single author, um, you know, but there's plenty of modern games that are also works of folk culture. League of Legends, you know what I mean? Like, like Dota is kind of a work of folk culture. Like Dota is, is the result of, of many kind of mods and maps kind of coalescing around several, you know, a bunch of different people. They all had contributions It kind of evolved as folk culture. Uh, it's just weird to me to make that distinction. So I said, look, we're going to capitalize all games. And then if it's a product, it gets italicized. So video games and board games that are commercial products get capitalized, but all game titles, I'm sorry, get get italicized, but all game titles get capitalized. And uh, mm-hmm. so that, that was something where I had to kind of like work with my editor and work with the uh, copy editor, uh, but they were really agreeable to that. And um I would like to advocate that as a new standard. I, I, I'll i put it out there as a, I think this is how New York Times should do it. Um, and I'm willing to go to war <laughs> with the New York Times <laughs> about this or whoever is in charge of that, the MLA or the, um, I don't know who AP does Style. standards for yeah. the AP styles. I'll go, I'll go to war with AP styles right now. <laughs> I, um, I was don't you think at, that, at, that makes sense? I agree. agree. I'm a huge okay. nerd for journalistic, like, uh, composition and editing guidelines and I'm it was something I, I wasn't even conscious of reading it but just seeing poker capitalized made sense when you're talking about it in the same league as uh Serpentis or which I want to get to but uh yeah yeah but like I, imagine I'm a fan the of pickleball that. I don't know whether pickleball is a is a product but maybe pickleball is trademarked right it, 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 think of how inappropriate it is to be writing about tennis and pickleball and using a small t for tennis and a capital p for pickleball it's just this doesn't make sense like they're they are very similar they're, you know what i mean they're two they should they're both titles of of works and so yes. since this whole book was about looking at games as works of culture i thought like i should make a stand so that was the i would say that was the big uh, yeah, that was the the most important kind of copy editing uh, thing that, I, that I'm very proud of. As an editing nerd, thank you for sharing that example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of examples, uh, 
the book opens. Did I even say the title right? Is it is it Serpent Serpentis? Serpentes. Serpentes um, is one of a few. There, you know, there's a lot of very the examples when used are effective and in, in appreciated, especially like the extended sections about Go in poker. Um, but how? So how did you choose the games that were explored more well, in detail? It, it, in the case of Serpentes, like I had the book opened with the chapter on like understanding what a what an aesthetic form is and you know understanding that okay first step one you have to understand that games are an aesthetic form and then like what are aesthetic forms and blah 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 and while i think it's important it's also a little bit dry <laughs> and <laughs> um and i was trying to think of ways to like and i think examples are really useful and good and so i said like and then so because in chapter two then i start giving examples i talk about go and i talk about poker and i think it, the, the book really kind of like benefits from the concreteness of of these examples so i said oh you know what let me start with an example uh, so i'll just like start with like i'm gonna apply my way of thinking about games by taking a game that i deeply love this beautiful little indie game uh by benjamin sule uh called serpentes and i'm gonna write just a brief description of my experience playing it and what I think is beautiful about it as as a way of like hitting the ground running. Uh, so before you get into any theoretical stuff, you get this kind of concrete example of like, this is how my experience of games, guys, how my brain works, you know, when I'm thinking about games. And this is like an example of, of, of and I was really happy with how that turned out. I, I felt like once that was in there, I just felt the whole book worked better. Then you start to get into the more thorny kind of theoretical stuff the laying the foundation for, for how to you know the kind of more conceptual theoretical framework uh but uh this is a, that's how the the serpentis thing got in there and i just wanted it also to be a video game because i use go and poker which are non-video games i wanted to people to understand no, there's a game there's a book about video games as well like i didn't want people to think mm -hmm. it's mostly a book about non-digital games because uh so uh so that was that one and then i mean overall i just picked games that i i just as examples i wanted to pick games that i thought you know meant something to me right that they actually were concrete examples of my own experience so i i, I talk about wipeout and uh i talk about quap uh yes. and <laughs> um yeah i i just uh they they just um, I just, yeah, I tried to pick, pick games that meant something to me so that I could use this uh, process of self-reflection, you know, to really talk about my own experience. Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's yeah. some quap for you, anybody watching the video version. Yeah. Boy, that's expert level quap, by the way. This is not, this is not <laughs> what quap looks like when I play it. We're watching Look a world that. record. It looks like I'm just looking at the Olympics. <laughs> is that Usain Bolt? What am I looking at? Look how good that is. That's incredible. Is that an AI or something? What am I? This oh is a gosh. world record run of Quop. Okay, yeah, there we go. Even even the world <laughs> record run is so weirdly awkward and clumsy. It's so beautiful. What a great game Quop is. So simple and uh, and amazing. Yeah. That's the cool part about the examples you chose is is these things that you know. I I don't think would be anybody's like first um, necessarily game that comes to mind and terms of thinking of them as aesthetics um but excellently like listing you know breaking the way the way quap makes us appreciate walking uh as an everyday activity that we are you know should uh not have to think about each action of but the minute you start breaking it down in game form uh is a cool connection to make oh man i um and, i, and I so talk about dark souls but but mostly yes. I, when i talk about dark souls i'm I'm talking about the this great review that that Michael Thompson wrote about Dark Souls, where he I think he referred to it as the worst game ever made, and but which I just loved. The thing I like about Michael Thompson is I think he is very honest about his own experience. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's not, like he's writing about a, a Dark Souls from a perspective of having lived inside of it very deeply and had this real profound experience with it and he's coming away with it trying to make sense of that experience and trying to to like understand 
like exactly all of these issues that I'm just talking about, but about the darkness of, of like being plunged into an experiment of what it means to be a conscious being in the world. Like it is, there is a, a kind of, and, and I think that, that that's, I don't know. I just found it really beautiful. I, I love, I love that, uh, that review. And I thought it was a great example of that's how, you know, you're in this domain, right? You're not talking about toasters. You're not talking about cars. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about lawn chairs, right? These are not products. These are works of culture. And this is, this is how, you know, that it's not just about like, oh, how does it work? Or what's the paint like, and what, you know, does it, how does it plug in? And, you know, is it efficient? And, you know, uh -huh. no, it's like, how did this make you feel? Like what is going on like with this? And how does it relate to the world and your life as a person um, like that to me is, uh, I, I just, I, I really like that. As you point out in the book, there's there's a reason that games have moved from the, the technology section of publications to the arts and culture sections. And well, there's still yeah, plenty although of- I will say I, I will say this, um, they've moved, they've kept moving and they just moved out of the arts and culture selection entirely. Like if you look at the New York Times, which last time it, it's maybe one of the only remaining newspapers, I don't know, I'm sure there's some others, but like the New York Times is the one I think of when I think of what a, a newspaper is. And the New York Times has basically just abandoned a, trying to talk about video games. Like they don't, yeah. there's really no concerted effort to discuss video games in the New York Times. Uh, and you can see why, like they've gone through periods where they have tried and they've never really gotten it. They've never been able to do it. It's a really hard problem. Uh, I don't know if you remember that special issue of the New York Times magazine, Sunday magazine, that had uh, rock band Beatles on the cover. And I think it was a Seth Schiesel article about like, hey, this is the most important video game ever. It's the rock band Beatles. And that did not age well. Like, I don't think yeah. the rock band Beatles is an important video game. Like it's a fine <laughs> video game. Like it's yeah. like not my favorite version of rock band. It's maybe my like third favorite version of rock band, you know, but um, it definitely wasn't this, like that was just an example of someone kind of getting it wrong. And uh, mm -hmm. it's really difficult to know how to cover these things. Cause do you, do you have each one, do you have to explain it? Like, how are you going to, how are you going to talk about vampire survivors in the New York times? Like, what are you going to do? Like what? Like, how are you going to talk about uh, about Disco Elysium? Are you going to explain what Baldur's Gate is, what a computer RPG is, what uh, um, what a Planescape Torment was, what Fallout was, like why these things were important, like how we thought about them, and then what this is? As like like how do you even begin to talk about Disco Elysium uh, if you don't are if you're not already kind of steeped in in video games as a hobby and and computer games and and their history and everything else like it's just where do you st like it's so hard uh mm -hmm. so they kind of have given up and um i would like them to try again quite honestly yeah i think it's bad to give up i think it it's important that that video games are like that the broader culture has some encounter with them and a way of thinking about them that isn't just looking at things their kids are doing or that they're looking at things that their cousin is doing or whatever you know what i mean and being like what the fuck mm -hmm. is that like yeah i mean as you open you know the defining art form of the 21st century and for that obviously like you said i too think they should give it another shot uh something that deserves to be right about and discussed both in in positive and negative lights um do you think was that on your mind at all when writing this book about laying out a framework for for not just players but for writers to think about games um i mean not consciously but i think yeah i think it was part of the overall project part of the overall project mm -hmm. is is how can i myself do it like i am not i'm uh, you know it's mostly i just wanted to try to do it and to try to do it as well as i could and but then also yes i would also like this to be a thing that is done. I, I, I want to participate both as a game designer, as someone who makes games, as a game player, as and then also as a thinker, someone who thinks about games. I want to be, I want to be participating in this ongoing project by game, whereby games continue to evolve, mm -hmm. uh, and and continue to kind of like 
reach their potential at possibly fulfilling this this destiny of being the defining art form of the century that we're in uh and and i think that um yeah i just want to to do my job you know what i mean like i just think that that's my job but as a designer as a thinker as a teacher as a player uh yeah i always want to be part of that that process by by which we're all kind of figuring out what are these things what are they good for what do we want more of what do we want how do we want them to evolve and and uh and you know what's cool about them and and what do we love about them and how do we get more of that yeah agreed i we've covered so much about the book um frank i just in closing is there anything any big takeaways from the book you know we, we you laid out the three kind of core steps that you walk through in the book are there any other takeaways we haven't discussed today that you want to dig into deeper no i want to emphasize what you said the book is short and fun easy to read <laughs> uh, available now on amazon where can people uh, find it other yeah find other fine bookstores wherever you can purchase books uh you can probably find this and uh but uh, I don't know. I also have a Substack uh, that you can um, check out my uh, writing. I write about games and art and artificial intelligence um, and how these things are all related to each other. So that's another place you can you can kind of follow my uh, my thinking on this topic. Well, thank you so much again, Frank. We'll link to uh, all of you listening or watching. You can check out the description for a link to the book page as well as Frank's Substack. And as you just noted in the last uh, answer, like I'm excited to see how this conversation continues to evolve um, because it will. And I'm glad that you and the, you know the people you've light to in the book um, are uh, shining light on that change that's happening. All right. Thank well, you Frank, very much. Anything uh, else you want to promote or where pleasure. people can find you? Uh, okay. I'm on I'm on Twitter, F Lance. Um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much me. Love it. Well, you can find the show everywhere at Real Time Strats. You can email us questions at podcast at triplepointpr.com. Once again, Frank, thank you so much for your time. It was just a pleasure digging into the book with you. Again, everybody, available now, description in the link. If you're interested in games or just cultural discourse in any form i highly recommend it. it's one of my favorite books of the year and with that thank you all so much for listening